Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, we're going to begin with a bit of a follow-up from last week and an international perspective on the weather, and I want to focus in right over here, over into this part of Asia. As I play this forward, we can actually see the two separate typhoons that did go through uh, parts of the Korean Peninsula, and then you can see the second one here hitting the Manchurian Plain. After uh, watching these animations and seeing the impacts of these particular typhoons, I went back and just made a map here showing you total accumulated precipitation uh, from the 29th of August through just a couple of days ago. We can see up here, and this is a very productive region for growing corn, soybeans, and other crops, that uh, the rainfall totals here were between 5 and some locations up to 10 inches in the Manchurian Plain. And then along the uh, coast here of both North and South Korea, we did see a few locations that were pushing uh, upwards of, of 18 inches of total rainfall. Some video reports have been coming in about some of the damage. This was uh, tweeted out by Nathan Lang here, showing us back on September 4th some of the damage from the winds uh, from the uh, typhoons that have gone through here on a, on a corn crop in that area. So uh, just some considerable damage both from flooding and from the winds out of that system. From there I'd like to take you to Europe. Look at the next 15 days in terms of the forecast through much of Central Europe uh, from, uh, from basically from France over to Poland. Things are looking dry. And then around the Black Sea again the Black Sea is here. We do see that Ukraine and southern Russian uh, wheat belt here is dry. Where it's wet seems to be north of that particular region as forecast by the European model. When looking back over the last 30 days now, what we see is that much of that same area, so right in through here, this would be Ukraine, and then the southern Russian wheat belt uh, are looking very dry over the last 30 days. And so as we think about what winter wheat plant is looking like, this is an area that uh, is forecast to be dry for the next 15 days and has been dry for at least the last 30, some locations picking up deficits of rainfall uh, greater than two inches over that time period. So we must watch that very carefully. And as we've been discussing here for the last couple of weeks, our line Nino right in through this particular area has been developing. The trade winds are stronger than normal. They remain stronger than normal. There's plenty of cold water beneath this and the La Nina signals for the late summer through fall and early winter, winter right now are quite strong. Keeping on this international perspective, let's see what that might mean for South America. Based on the satellite data here from Grace, we do notice that our soil moisture drought indicator here, surface soil moisture drought indicator, uh, comparing this to average, is still uh, below average in a large section of Brazil's growing area. So it, it's normally very dry this time of year in that area, but it is drier than normal. And as we approach the September 15th kind of uh, starting point for planting uh, the, the crops in the northern part of Brazil, we see that through the next 10 days, the operational European model is, is a very dry inside of this area. In fact, not predicting any precipitation. And it's wet along the periphery down here in southern Brazil, cutting through uh, Rio Grande do Sul. But also we're seeing quite a bit of just daily convection popping up uh, in the Amazon. As we stretch this out and look at the latest European weekly forecast, this goes out through October 7th. We do see that while the rains are anticipated to return at the beginning of October, the total deficit built up over that time period could be somewhere in the vicinity of of maybe up to five inches in this area, th three to five inches there, and also the same thing down here in southern Brazil. So I guess what this would tell me is that the pro the possibility of a rapid early planting uh, of the soybean crop is, is relatively low at this point. I would like to show you the latest seasonal output because with the developing La Nina, while it has a very weak correlation with what happens in central and northern Brazil, we can see that as I play out, this is in three month chunks. So this is October, November, December. As I play this four to that is November, December, January, and then finally here, January, February, March. We do notice that the long range European model continues to see drier conditions in southern Brazil, Uruguay, and then getting here into Argentina. So I think we're going to have to watch this La Nina carefully as potentially causing problems in southern Brazil and getting into Argentina for possibly having some drier conditions develop. It's just something I want to be watching and I want you to be watching with me at this point. From there, I would like to show you a satellite animation. This was just uh, kind of sun up to sundown yesterday. We can see the convection popping in the Amazon. See the little, they're not little, they're ginormous storms that, that show up here. But uh, while there are quite a few fires on the pasture land south of there, uh, this is not nearly the extent of the fires that we saw a year ago. So speaking of those fires, this was what things look like at the San Francisco International Airport yesterday. Uh, incredible imagery here as the smoke spread across much of California. Uh, some of the thickest smoke I've seen and blowing from the east to the west here. You can see it in this satellite animation 
watch this. This was uh, th uh, midday yesterday here, and you're going to see the sunset, and you'll just be able to see the extent of the smoke stretching from the Pacific Northwest, especially coastal Oregon, down through the Central Valley of California. And to be honest, it's been a long time since I've seen a smoke plume that is that thick. Now, if you get over the four corner states right in through this particular area, that's the position of our upper level low. And if I just play this one more time quickly for you, you can see the intense convection that is here along the coast stretching from the Carolinas up to the mid-Atlantic and some locally very very heavy rainfall in those areas. Well where's that smoke going? Let me start that over again. This is from our high resolution rapid refresh model. So the smoke that is right now blowing from the east to the west over the Pacific, remember that that's got to come back as the winds shift back over to the westward direction. So we're going to have air quality issues for quite some time. But do notice our deep upper level trough that was that has been spinning here over the four corner states will throughout the day today getting into tomorrow start to make its way basically toward Minnesota and the Great Lakes and it will be wrapping up quite a bit of smoke into it as it does move forward. So we might get some very interesting sunsets out ahead of this, although it will be quite wet into this area as well with a lot of cloud cover. Okay, from there, I would like to show you at least how much snow did fall out of this over the last three days. So you can just pause the video and take a look at um, a few locations here, uh, but some very heavy snowfall in the mountains. But I think what I, I want to get to is how much time was spent below freezing. So this particular analysis goes from the 8th and the 9th only. So this does not include this morning and shows you the number of hours spent below freezing. Now, this is from the RTMA data, which is an hourly product. So there could have been places in here around these areas where we did get a frost so that's that is certainly on the table but overall this is kind of the extent of our our frost map that we have so far from this particular event right now we're going to watch this area early this morning to see if temperatures are going to continue to bottom out uh, in that particular region uh, to get another frost here and as of 420 when I was recording this we did see some regions up through here that were below freezing and also getting back again into western Nebraska this is an area that we were starting to to see some temperatures uh, drop back off below freezing there in South Dakota, Western Nebraska, getting into Wyoming. So I just want to give you a quick update on those current temperatures. How much rain have we seen so far out of this? Well, it's been extremely heavy in parts of Texas getting into Oklahoma and even through early this morning as the rain was spreading into parts of Iowa, uh, Missouri, and then it's on its way toward Wisconsin in the coming days. We can see that leading up to this, we did bring quite a bit of precipitation over an area uh, that was extremely dry uh, as of late. You can see the larger dry spot that has been the result of this upper level flow pattern as long as as well as some of the intense storms that have been over there along the east coast but if we just look at what the impact of this has been i'm going to take you back two weeks ago to thursday august 27th looking at the top four inches of soil moisture in terms of percentile and what i want to do now is i want to show you the latest map and we can see if i just go back and forth here's the previous map so two weeks ago and this is the latest we've seen a pretty massive improvement in soil moisture but for most this is soil moisture that's coming in too late to make a significant impact on the crop in the midsection of the United States. So let's see where this is all going. Let's just get this right up to early this morning. So this is 6 a.m. What the radar will, will be looking like as the sun rises here. And what we're going to see is that as we press throughout the day on Thursday, broad shield of precipitation moves through parts of Iowa, Missouri, and northern Illinois and through this area. The upper level low is still back here and widely scattered storms here along the eastern part of the United States. So this is 4 p.m. this afternoon. Let's get into the evening hours. You're going to see the upper level low finally begin to move, and there could be some light showers out ahead of this, a lot of drizzle uh, going on here. Right now, none of this is forecast to be falling as snow as we get into the overnight hours tonight into early tomorrow morning. So again, we still have another push of, of rainfall coming through this area as we work through the day on Friday. Now getting into Friday evening and early, early Saturday morning, we expect the wave to finally be moving here across Wisconsin. So it's going to take another three days for this to move out of the four corner states here and finally get over toward the Great Lakes. So that's the forecast through 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. If we just kind of compare some models here, this is from the European model. So once again, we're anticipating relatively light precipitation wrapped around the upper level low, but out ahead of it where the moisture transport is, we could be seeing an area through here that picks up anywhere between three quarters of an inch and upwards of maybe an inch and a half of precipitation. There will be a very well-defined dry boundary here on this side, and we're still anticipating rather intense convection here along the east coast. I'll just show you the same forecast from the GFS model for completeness here, and right now the two models through the next three days have pretty good agreement.
From there, let's talk about the day four through seven pattern. I think at this point, the European model has the upper hand on this pattern. I'm just gonna label a few things for us here. Monday through Tuesday, next week, we are gonna watch a deeper trough that comes out of the Gulf of Alaska. This could be bringing some desperately needed rain here to the, uh, to the windward side of the Cascade Mountains where those fires are. Tuesday through Thursday, there's gonna be a low that cuts from the Canadian prairies here over toward Ontario and locally some, some wetter weather in that area, but generally in the midsection of the United States drier conditions. What we're going to watch is as the uh, first cutoff low leaves and the second low cuts across the Canadian prairies, there will be a high pressure cell that will develop midweek next week over the northeast. And as it does so, the flow around it will be bringing in uh, quite a bit of moisture here into parts of our cotton belt. So think Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, that part of it. And we will be seeing quite a bit of convection coming out of Mexico into southern Texas uh, as well. So this is how things are shaping up in that four to seven day time period. And also we'll see Paul let kind of glance our map here over there on the right. As we stretch this out to day 10, one of the major changes that we have been seeing here as of late is that this area, which through much of the month of August, getting into early September, had anomalously high pressure, is now moved over to a low. What that's going to do is that's going to keep the jet stream moving something like this with possibly some split flow here across the western part of the United States. We can see that by just looking at the jet stream winds. So again, troughing now in this area, split flow across the west, this is going to mean relatively drier conditions, especially in California, which we would expect, but also quite a bit of warmth west. And if the jet stream does stay north uh, here, this will open up uh, the, the Gulf Coast states and the East Coast for, for tropical cyclone activity. Even stretching this out to day 15 time period, very robust jet stream coming across the Pacific seems to want to split here, if you notice, uh, as we go across the West Coast. So what does all of that mean? Well, with troughs coming in like this, let's take a look at what the precipitation pattern is going to be. The GFS is keeping an area through here into week two with better chances of being wet. The European a bit farther to the east with that, but the European has given some very interesting signals in terms of tropical activity right in through here that we're going to have to watch very carefully into week two. So some model differences here that we're going to have to hash out over the next couple of days into the week two forecast. But let's talk about the tropics because as I go all the way out with the European ensemble to Tuesday the 22nd, several of the ensemble members are trying to produce tropical systems that are just off the coast. Now, this is common for the model to do this, but we actually have good reason to think that maybe this is something we should be watching much more carefully. Currently, the five-day graphical outlet looks like this. We do need to watch a system over the weekend get into the Gulf near Florida. And again, this will be part of the moisture transport middle and end of next week that is, could be coming into, like I said, this part of the southeast. We still have the active convection just off the coast. But uh, Paulette, Renee, and could this here be Sally? Uh, we're going to have to watch that very carefully. Here's what the European model is suggesting. Paulette stays out in open ocean, so does Renee, but it's this next wave which has been given a 90% chance of kind of surviving here and becoming a tropical depression. I want to watch carefully over the next week as it moves toward the Lesser Antilles. And now we start to see low pressure system tracks getting into the uh, um, Gulf of Mexico too. So the tropics warm, very active, and wind shear is more favorable than, than it would be otherwise to let these systems continue to develop. So let's talk temperatures as we work our way toward the end of this. Here's Thursday's high temperatures. Again, another very cold one here, but quite hot uh, over in the northwest and warm out ahead of this. Playing forward from Thursday, let's get into Friday. We're going to continue to see the temperatures moderate in the midsection of the country from Friday into Saturday. And as the ridge builds in, look at the warmth that does start to spread here uh, across parts of the Canadian prairies, but also getting here uh, into Montana, North and South Dakota. The upper level O, remember, is still spinning through this area. So this is a lot of cloud cover and precipitation induced cooling here. Same thing on the East Coast. Going from Saturday into Sunday and then into Monday and Tuesday. Again, what we're watching here early next week is for the storms into this area, but broadly the, the jet stream retreats north, warmth returns for the midsection of the United States, really the, the northern half of the plains here. As we go from Tuesday out to next Wednesday, we're keeping a close eye on how that pattern is going to continue to evolve.
From there, let's look at the six to 10 day pattern. Remember at, at this particular point, we were starting to see that trough develop in this area. So what ends up happening is this region around the trough tends to stay cool. We can see it in both models, but with that split flow in the West, we, we do see the warmer conditions in the West spreading into the central part of the United States. From that six to 10 day, all the way out to the 11 to 15, the models still agree. If you just notice, there's still good agreement that that upper level trough that will be in this area is gonna keep the, that particular region in North America on the cooler side of things, but allow above average temperatures to expand from the West Coast into the central United States. Elsewhere, much closer to normal is what the models are currently forecasting. What I'd like to do to finish this up is I wanna invite you to go watch my long range forecast from yesterday, but I wanna bring up one important point from it, okay? We looked at what October was holding for us and we compared it to the current La Nina situation. We noticed that the Pacific Northwest and the British Columbia was forecast wet by the European model, but we did not see strong precipitation signals either way in the midsection of the country. One of the reasons for that, and we can see it again here echoed in the National Multimodel Ensemble and the International Multimodel Ensemble, as October favoring, again, possibly drier conditions here with wet cutting into this part of Canada and the Pacific Northwest. Some of the reasons for that have to deal with this particular pattern the model is currently forecasting. Now, I'll leave you to watch the video from yesterday, but I, I kind of showed in that video how different this was from October of 2018, where there was a stationary boundary in through here and extremely wet conditions. We also compared this, again, that ridge to what was going on in 19, where a deep trough came in here out of the Canadian prairies into the central United States and opened up the Gulf and kept things very, very wet. But I do want to stress one last thing. When I look at those hyperactive hurricane years, okay, they often feature more ridging in this area, which lets systems cut in underneath that through the month of October. There is a lot of similarities in our upcoming pattern over Alaska and over uh, the Canadian Maritimes with high pressure that is similar to our very active hurricane years. Uh, and, and I want to make sure that everyone is just very well aware of that. Hey, thanks for a great week here. I look forward to talking again next week with the latest updates. And uh, with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you.